Hi, if you're attending today, you know a little bit about, or at least have heard of exosomes. Exosomes hold a lot of potential to deepen our understanding of biology, cell communication, and is looking to be leveraged right now to improve human health outcomes. My name is Jim West, CEO of Clara Biotech, and I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes talking with you about exosomes, what they are, why they're important, and tactically, how do you access them to start unlocking their potential? Today, I'm going to break this down into three categories. We're going to talk about exosome fundamentals. What are exosomes? How do we define them? And where do they come from? Then we're going to break into kind of isolation modalities and the efficacy of them, the pros and cons of different methods and trade-offs. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a product we've been developing for a while. So let's first talk about exosomes and subtypes. What are exosomes and what are subtypes? By the end of this, you'll understand how we define them, and we'll talk about subtypes and what they mean and how they're going to impact research in the future and how that uh, subtype activity can affect downstream work and analysis. So exosomes are created in the endosomal pathway specifically, as opposed to microparticles, vesicles, and apoptotic bodies. They come from a very special pathway. Exosomes are functionalized with surface marker proteins that they inherit from the parent cell. These surface marker proteins are numerous and measure in the hundreds or higher. There we go. Exosomes are generally recognized to be less than 200 nanometers in diameter, which does overlap with other particles created in the body. The Nobel Prize was awarded in 2013 to Dr. James Rothman, Randy Sheckman, and Thomas Sudoff for their discoveries of machinery regulating vesicle traffic, a major transport system in our cells. Exosomes are a classification of vesicles, and the very early work exosomes were recognized to be a waste disposal mechanism from cells. And it was only recently in the last 10 years that we really started to understand the actual biological mechanisms and that the function of these exosomes goes so much further. Exosomes act as a communication network between cells. They exit cells that make them and they enter cells of the same type where they're able to cross the cell's boundaries based on those protein surface markers. And practically, they're endocytosed into the recipient cells, which are similar to the host parent cells. So there has been some debate and discussion over how exosomes are actually defined. Because of heterogeneity, which I'll cover later, there's a debate over the best way to qualify them. Exosomes have traditionally been based on size, partly because that's how we've been able to isolate and characterize them based on the methods that have been available. You can see in this chart, there are a range of sizes of particles in that same region, which are not exosomes like microvesicles, apoptotic bodies, and more. This is important. Clearly, there are many other things at this size range that overlap, and this causes noise, confusion, and challenges in getting into the signals which the exosomes contain. The takeaway is that size is not the most important factor in classification. More important than size is the surface markers. Maybe they're more critical to really understanding and determining exosome populations and their subpopulations. So what makes an exosome, we believe that part of what makes an exosome an exosome are these functional surface markers and its internal contents, which you can see here. Exosomes, as far as we know, are made by all cells, human, plant, and animal. They contain important markers consisting of surface-bound proteins from the cell, but also fragments of DNA and RNA, like messenger RNA and microRNA. The surface protein markers are the key to cross other cells' boundaries. We estimate there are nearly 1,000 exosomes to every cell in the body. And inside the exosomes, as you can see, are the fragments of DNA and the RNAs on the surface of the proteins surrounded by a lipid bilayer. There are hundreds of surface proteins in the marker, on, on the surface of these exosomes, and they vary. 
And with these exosomes, you can actually perform any type of analysis you like, including DNA sequencing, ELISA, RNA sequencing like NGS, next-gen sequencing, or proteomics. So let's talk about the endosomal pathway. Again, exosomes are membrane-bound vesicles, a lipid bilayer nanoparticle, and are small from 50 to 150 nanometers in diameter. They do contain important tissues and unique markers that have importance in biomarker analysis with great potential for future diagnostic applications. What this all means is that the exosomes are traceable to the cells they originated from. As a doctor once told me, exosomes are the expressomes because they give you a map to the body. It gives you a trace to where they came from and possibly where they're going. Exosomes are perfect, naturally derived delivery platform. Because exosomes contain a cellular bilipid membrane layer, they're very stable in blood circulation. They are highly biocompatible. They are naturally found in all of our body fluids and many tissues. Because of their small size and because they carry surface receptors, they have a much higher penetration ability in crossing difficult biological barriers, such as the blood-brain barrier, digestive tissue, and more. Think about that. If you were to drink a glass of milk in a short period of time, we can detect cow milk exosomes in your bloodstream. The cargos inside of exosomes are protected from degradation and release. Instead, they wait until they reach the target tissue or cells of biocompatibility to deliver their specific cargo directly to the cell of interest. This is a really unique way to deliver targeted nucleic acids anywhere in the body with virtually no toxicity. As a poor analogy, exosomes act as a parcel delivery network from one location to another in our natural systems. But let's stop before we take the analogy too far. More recently, what's now being looked into is the heterogeneity within which exosome, sorry, the heterogeneity within exosome subpopulations, the variances from exosomes within single cell sources. This becomes crucial when we start to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, this becomes crucial when we start to talk about our definition of an exosome, as there is great variance within the population, even from single sources. Like many things in biology, it's not optimized. Instead, it's noisy and robust. Because of this heterogeneity, there's not just differences between exosomes from a single cell source, but exosomes in a population. We need to go beyond size to truly understand what we're dealing with. As you can see, we have variance in size distribution. The individual content of exosomes, the functionality of exosomes, and variance between the sources of cells generating exosomes. Size misses out on the range of variants within these populations and doesn't even begin to address the other noise in the system. What we're saying is that content from different parent cells will have different molecular content and perform different functions within the cell. Different cell sources will produce different types of exosomes. It's quite complex. A better world is one where we can get to the subpopulations of exosomes differentiate between their properties to be able to evaluate not just subpopulations from a single cell type, but even subpopulations within that. As an example, here's a comparison of 3D to 2D cell culture derived exosomes. You can see we actually cultured the same tumor cell, in this case a cervical cancer, in 2D and 3D cultures, and then compared microRNA profiles secreted from the exosomes. The 2D cell culture-derived exosomes, and looking at the microRNA, we see a profile that's similar to the 2D cell culture cells itself, but it's completely different from the 3D cultured RNA. Look at the highlighted boxes. Look at the highlighted boxes showing the difference in RNA expression. This 3D culture-derived profile is more close to the in vivo tissue system. You can see this because we compared the RNA expression and it was the closest. We also validated the top microRNA expression level by RT-PCR in the figure shown on the right. Our sequencing data conforms really well with, uh, with 
our sequencing data conforms really well, which further validates our data and that shows 3D production stimulates production of exosomes similar to the in vivo system. Now let's look at how production level changes. Here we have a comparison of exosome production over time. What you notice is that the 2D cell life cycle is much shorter than 3D cultured cells, which live much longer. That timeline is extended and it goes through these similar processes. So there's an accelerated degradation in 2D. But as you can see, the expression rate of exosomes varies based on 2D versus 3D. The trend of 2D expression starts fast and slows down as it ages over the life of the cell. 3D increases secretion over time because cell communication is more active and more exosomes secrete along with proliferation. The bottom graph shows changes to exosome morphology or size and can be seen in both bottom graphs. 2D cultured exosomes show the size is most abundant around 60 to 80 nanometers and 3D cultured exosomes have the most abundant size around 120 nanometers. The 3D derived exosome is more evenly distributed and the 2D exosome is wider with more variance. These are really interesting images that show the diverse morphology of exosomes. So we simplify exosomes in the literature as a spherical lipid nanoparticle. In reality, the biology is slightly more complex. If you look at the top row, you can see single exosomes. That's how we normally think of exosomes. However, if you look at the second row, you see what they call double exosomes. Double exosomes is actually an exosome inside of an exosome. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is very challenging to think of in terms of size, but the, the variance there is great. They even have what they call small double. The scale, of these res the scale of these emission microscopes is at the 50 nanometer scale. And you can see that they're very, very small. There's also oval shaped on the bottom. And if you go to the right side, you can see even more variances. You have tubules, long, stretched out exosomes. You have incomplete exosomes, which have been damaged and degraded. And you also have, sorry, it's hard to read, pleomorphic exosomes, uh, various sizes that don't fit a general description. So while we idealize exosomes as spherical lipids with bilayers, the reality is that exosomes have a diverse range of shapes and sizes, further complicating the story of size uh, filtration and size definition of exosomes. Due to this known heterogeneity within the shape, it's even more challenging to assume a simple size definition. So now let's transition as we've talked about exosomes and their subtypes, and we're gonna start talking about the traditional methods of isolating exosomes and how that can affect the downstream processing. Here's a high level overview of the ways that you can isolate exosomes today. We need to come up with a better isolation approach. In the top, you have differential centrifugation and you have density gradient centrifugation. These are generally achieved by ultra centrifugation in a long and uh, arduous isolation process. You can see the, the time scale in the graph here is three to nine hours and uh, up to 90 hours. We in practice have seen people doing up to 24 hours and it, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes uh, the specialized ultracentrification equipment and the expertise to process those. In addition, uh, the next methods that we look at are based on filtration. So you have size exclusion chromatography and you have ultrafiltration. These methods uh, filter through based on size. So instead of density in the top, you now have size uh, to filter through membranes. And size, as we've discussed, is, is effective to get exosomes, but it's not the most important and critical parameter. On the bottom, we have immunocapture, which is using immunomagnetic beads with targeted antibodies attached to the surface. And these antibodies will be able to attach to the protein surface markers on the exosomes. This is actually a method that's great to get subtypes in pure exosomes. But once you've captured an exosome with this method, it's attached to and fixed to the bead, and there is no getting it off. Uh, the last method we can talk about is precipitation, uh, polymer precipitation, where the exosomes are bound and uh, precipitate out of the solution. 
Ultra centrifugation, also known as the gold standard, is, as we mentioned, it's labor intensive, it's time consuming, and it has a number of challenges. Re reproducibility and repeatability is difficult. We know that the loss rate of exosomes in this process is high because uh, over a 12 to 24 hour period uh, or even less, you start getting degradation of the exosomes. We also know that exosomes are very sensitive to shear stresses. While they're robust in the body systems, they're very sensitive to shear stresses. And that shear stress, that, that, that force over time, uh, they actually have data that will show you these exosomes uh, will become flattened. So their morphology functionally changes. The low recovery rate, the loss rate, and the noise that comes along with these processes has a number of challenges, but they do get exosomes, and it was how the it was the first method that came along for purification. Polymer precipitation, uh, as you can see here, uh, there's a number of products that do this. Uh, these exosomes are bound to the polymer, and you can see that they're kind of uh, if you think of the exosomes as marbles in a solution, the uh, the polymer wraps them in a bag, so you can get them. They can be used for certain diagnostic purposes, but they are functionally changed and they're bound. It's a tedious process. It's not good for scaling up or doing a large volume of processing, but it is effective for getting exosomes isolated, additionally with the other things at this size range that come along. Size exclusion chromatography has really been breaking out in terms of manufacturing and production because you can isolate exosomes without the shear stresses induced by ultracentrifugation, and you get a high recovery rate. But you also co-purify with the other membrane vesicles and other things like chromatin, cell-free DNA, ectosomes, viruses, all come along at these size ranges. And while these methods work, they are also uh, time-consuming and material-consuming. Immunobead capture, as I mentioned, you start with a bead solution as shown in the uh, orange, and these beads uh, attached with uh, surface-marked antibodies are able to capture exosomes in a solution once mixed. Using a magnet, which the uh, beads have an iron core, you can capture the beads together, wash the contaminants away, and you're left with a solution of beads and uh, isolated contaminants or noise that's washed away. This allows you to subtype. You can do uh, capture of, of using the antibodies on the surface. You can tune them to what you want. If you're looking for a specific type of uh, cancer exosomes, you could conjugate an EPCAM or other cancer-specific antibody to the surface. If you're trying to do broad capture, there's a tetraspanin uh, you can use for that. Uh, commonly, CD9, 63, and 81 are used, but there's other combinations also available to achieve that goal. And once these exomes have been captured, you can lyse the surface to release them for sequencing. But again, once they're bound, there's, there's no getting them off. So when we talk about the importance of subtyping for research, there's really only one technique and solution which allows you to get to the, to the subtypes of the exosome populations. And you want to be cautious in your downstream isolation steps it's critical if you don't do it right, you're going to get misleading results that don't give you what you expect and can mess up your test. It's really important that as the industry progresses that we're able to settle on a repeatable, consistent protocol for exosome isolation. This doesn't really exist today. Subtypes are an emerging area of focus that are going to have large implications in the future, and research activities around this should not be ignored. It should be considered. Isolation should not be considered lightly. You must take account of your experience of your lab personnel, the availability of equipment, and the downstream work that you specifically want to do, your characterization needs, and ultimately what the purpose of this research activity is. Now, before we wrap this up, I'd like to show you some of the stuff we've been developing at Clara Biotech, which I'm pretty excited about. So at Clara Biotech, 
we've developed uh, an iterative step, uh, a new paradigm, if you will, in exosome isolation. So we are actually based on the amino capture technology. But what we've developed is the next stage of production that allows for the release of exosomes from those bound beads. It's a non-chemical photo release process. So just like beads, we mix the samples with our bead technology to capture the exosomes to the surface of these functionalized beads using targeted antibodies. These beads are isolated with a magnet, just like amino capture, and we separate the impurities from the bound beads. But then, as you look to the right, we have a photo release step. Now, this photo release step is fairly short. It's less than 15 minutes. And in this time, we're able to detach the exosomes from the bead. And since they're still magnetized, we can actually isolate pure exosomes from the beads. And this opens up a new way to do characterization and analysis, along with subtyping. And it gives you pure exosomes without the noise. This is a chart called an NTA, nano tracking analysis. This is a commonly used characterization of exosome purity and quality. And as you can see here, on the X axis, we have size in nanometers from zero to a thousand in this case. And on the Y axis, we have concentration or number of exosomes per sample. Now, what I want you to see is that we have a very narrow uh, band uh, around 100 to 300 nanometers showing the uh, concentration of particles. When you, when you look at other methods, you see a, a much larger noise uh, around this sort of bell curve, if you will. Here's, here's another uh, view to, to something like that. And you can see that the size distribution is, in this case, uh, I believe this is from a 2D cell culture uh, media, but, but you can see that the, the size range is smaller and you have a, a high, high peaks uh, around 100 to 200 nanometers. This, this method, uh, when compared to ultracentrifugation, as an example, as you can see here, uh, gives you a more pure result. So in this case, I'm actually comparing uh, our exo release technology on the left with ultracentrifugation on the right column. The, the dashed lines is ultracentrifugation, the solid lines is the Clara exo release technology. Again, bounded in a smaller region around the exosome window because we're capturing functional exosomes as opposed to the full, the full spectrum. And there's about five times more, uh, I'm sorry, there's in this case, 10 times more material captured in the ultracentrifugation process. But you can see how much wider that noise is produced in that system. This is a uh, another sort of a breakdown of how the technology compares across the board. And... Uh, I'll let you guys analyze that on your own. But for but doing biomarker analysis, all technologies can get you there, although getting to the right data can be challenging. Uh, this is a picture showing our exo release beads with captured exosomes on the surface prior to release. And you can see the density. Each of those arrows points to an exosome on the surface of the bead. We have a really high capture rate of exosomes, greater than 90% from a solution using our technology. The, the, the exosomes and the bees are bound very well for, for high capture rates. This is a picture of a transmission electron microscope, TEM, showing uh, exosomes captured in this technology. Again, you can see a great kind of uniformity of, of material here. Uh, you can even see some of these other uh, exosome shape types, where here we actually have on the left three exosomes bound in a, in a vesicle as well. Uh, I think next to that is a double, a double exosome as well. But again, great, uh, great purity of, of exosomes captured. There's a number of different assays and tests that you can do with exosomes. One thing that we care about is the functionality and the viability of these exosomes once they've been isolated. Uh, 
If you look at ultra centrifugation, due to those shear forces and the time involved, uh, in this case, we're able to show that using our technology without those shear forces and using our gentle release capture, capture release technology, we actually have higher cell uptake. So in this case, uh, dendritic monocytes uh, in the fluorescent green, uh, we can see that, that we have significant cell uptake relative to the gold standard in isolation. So the Clara Exeter release technology we've developed, uh, our approach and benefits, we're able to provide functional exosomes with subtypes. And there's really no other method today to be able to get to pure functional subtyped exosomes that are isolated from a solution. We're able to reduce noise in isolation and increase reproducibility. And hopefully, you know, our goal is to move the industry towards standardization, one protocol that gets you the same results each time, every time, regardless of what you're trying to do. Additionally, by being based on immunomagnetic bead technology, which has been around for more than 35 years and is well understood within laboratory operations, it's easier to train personnel on how to do this process versus some of the more specific exosome uh, processes that have been used traditionally. We've been uh, running a lab service for the last year, and this is just an example of some of the companies we've worked with that we're able to show you. Uh, we're in the process of launching a kit right now to allow people, researchers like yourselves, in your own labs to, to use this technology. And we are uh, working towards a product launch in the next few months. But with that, if you'd like to learn more, you can go to our website, uh, and check us out. We, we have data there. And you're, you're welcome to partake of our lab service. If you don't want to do the work yourself, you can mail us your biological samples of interest. Uh, we can work with virtually any fluid. And it's fast and easy. If you'd like to learn more about the kit and look at doing the work yourself, you can also sign up for our early access program, which is ongoing right now today. With that, I will... Uh, end this talk. I hope that you've uh, been able to learn about exosomes and, and subtypes and, and why that matters, how we define an exosome and how uh, there's so much variance within exosomes, even within single cell production, there, there's variance in exosomes. It's not a it's not a uniform or homogenous situation. If you have any interest in cell uptake, one uh, fascinating and exciting thing about exosomes is they are autologous in nature. Um, I'm sorry, they're allogeneic in nature. They're not autologous. So, so you can actually capture an exosome from a general cell source, and that generally has no known toxicity effects in uh, reception by other, other cells and other bodies. So with that, I'll close it out. Thank you for your time, and enjoy the rest of the conference.